And she partners up with me. I don't know if you've watched some of this. Okay, we are going live right now. It's setting up and I think we'll be live in one second. And I better turn down the volume of this other thing. Otherwise, it's going to go on both. Welcome, everyone. We are super excited to be here with Dr. Lee Hellander Rubin on Fertility Talks because we are going to talk about painful sex. It's a great topic. <laughs> and you know what? It's something that nobody really talks about. And so we are going to address it. What the heck is it? What can we do about it? And Lee Hollander Rubin is like a doctor of Chinese medicine and acupuncturist. She's like a leading acupuncturist. And, and I actually have to say, you are a pioneer in our field because you've done so much research. And I'm like super honored that you are coming on here to share your wisdom with us. So I, I think let's get right on it. And, um, you know, you have a specialty with regards to vulvodynia. Do you want to speak to that? Like you know, the definition, what it is, all that. Sure. sure. Thanks, Mary. Thank you so much. T Tanya also as well. Thank you for having me. Um, so vulvodynia is essentially a pain in the genitals, uh, especially female genitals, um, people who menstruate, and uh, it is it is not explained by any other pathology. And it is a chronic pain and it can come and go, it can be provoked, it can be generalized, meaning you have it all the time, it doesn't matter where it is. Um, it can be provoked in the sense of like only it happens when you have some type of contact or pressure or rubbing, some kind of thing like that. The other thing about it is that it can be intermittent or it can come and go like when it is provoked or it can always be there. Uh, it can it will never go away. But something that should be really known about painful sex is that there's a lot of reasons why someone might have uncomfortable or painful penetrative intercourse or sex. And um, it could be from endometriosis, it could be from uh, pelvic myalgia. And pelvic myalgia is where the muscles are um, really tight and hypertonic is what we would call it. Um, it has been called vaginismus historically, the, the newer term is pelvic myalgia. Uh, other reasons could be because of hormone changes. Um, there could be uh, other kinds of physical anatomical problems that cause pain. And there's more, but I think that's enough of a, of a, of a list. But for vulvodynia specifically as a cause for painful sex, um, it, is, it is something that is really hard to get a diagnosis for because you have to rule out all that other stuff first. And the treatment isn't really clear and it's often multimodal. So you have to do lots of different things like medications, physical therapy, I would recommend acupuncture as part of my research. We found that acupuncture did provide benefit for women reducing their pain by about 50% and it stayed reduced when we followed up with them three months after the end of treatment. So vulvodynia is, is and just painful sex in general, can be something acupuncture can address. Um, but I also like to do it in um, in a team to support a patient because it's 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 about the pain, it's about the skin, it's about the muscles, it's about sexual confidence, it's all of the things. So thank you so much for addressing the acupuncture piece. I mean, that you have to actually go someone to a practitioner to do this. So just to provide a bit more guidance, how would one do this? Meaning like, how long would it take? How long is the treatment therapy? Is it once a week? Is it once a day? Let's give us the goods. Oh, Mary, I love your question. Um, so in the research, how we designed it, because this is something that you don't want to just try and treat every couple of weeks. You, the first part of our study we did, we set it up where people got two treatments a week for six weeks. And then we followed up for six more weeks with one treatment a week. So we kind of really went after the pain for the first six weeks. And then we tried to like ensure that we maintained the reduction in pain for the following six weeks. And so when I see someone, when I start to work with them, um, I mean, when you're in a research study, you have to like reduce all of the other influential factors. I don't have to do that in real practice. I can do all of the things, right? Like we can do the mm -hmm. PT, we can do the acupuncture. So I will have them come twice a week for the first six weeks if they can afford to do that or their insurance will cover it. Sometimes, you know, you'll have limitations, but if they can't, I'll see them once a week and then I'll add in other kinds of therapies to um, address pain at home. 
So does that include, I mean, we're going to go ahead. And so this is like a precursor to another episode yeah. with regards to the TEAS machine. Do yes. you say that? Okay, awesome. So you guys need to watch out for that podcast because we're going to go into details around that. But let's continue. So here's the thing. I can just imagine people at home thinking acupuncture once or twice a week. Are you going to do it on my Vijay chain? No, great. <laughs> also really important. That's, I get that question. Like the first time I was like, where are you going to put the needles? In fact, in our, in our, <laughs> in our research packet, we clearly said no needles will go in the genitals at all. So, uh, <laughs> while there is an acupuncture point near the genitals, but not in the genitals, we didn't even use that one, even though it is indicated for pain because it's so invasive and we wanted people to want to actually try the acupuncture. And honestly, we know there's lots of, we, you and I, Mary know, that there's lots of ways to use acupuncture there are many ways to the park as they say so um so what we do is we try to use points that are uh that are uh traditionally and selected to address pain but also in the research actually we looked at chinese medicine diagnosis so we look we did an assessment we we did a pattern differentiation and then we designed a treatment around that so we individualized treatments to what the person was experiencing so some people with vulvar pain that's because of vulvodynia it'll be worse when it's really cold out when it's like maybe um uh, if they've been swimming and they're wearing a swimsuit and then they notice that the pain gets really worse after like walking around in a wet swimsuit. Um, there's other folks that really notice that, oh my gosh, if I have a hot bath, it is worse after I do that. Or if I get really hot and sweaty, it is terrible. Um, so those temperential, those temperature differentials are important in our diagnosis. And sometimes people don't notice anything. Maybe it's like there is no difference in the temperature. Uh, and it's just that the pain is always there. Or when I get it, it's really strong and it's really um, stabbing pain. So that's all really helpful in helping us decide how are we going to treat someone. Um, I think your other question that you asked before that I'm not sure I fully answered is that even though I saw people twice a week, we did treatment for about 30 minutes. You know, that's that's historically in the in the literature, the research literature is being effective for pain treatments. That's great. And that's very, very important so that people have that informed choice. So when you go, because, you know, not everyone as a practitioner may know this. So you as a consumer can actually share it and share this podcast with your potential care providers as well. So you can advocate for your treatments and the way that would, would work because, you know, I've heard you speak so many times and we talk about how dosing matters. Can you speak to that, please? Sure. Uh, dosing is something that we talk about, like how frequently does someone really need to come into the office for treatment? And I, there's lots of factors that influence that, like, again, talking about individuals, like what do they really need? Um, but the research tells us that uh, twice a week for treatment has been a very effective for pain conditions. And we're also finding it can be very effective during certain phases of fertility treatment. We'll go into that later. But uh, the other piece is that, you know, one and done is not enough. And and there's other pieces of, of approach. Let me say this in a different way. In when we think about IVF specifically in vitro fertilization, most of the research that we've seen is where, oh, people just do acupuncture on the day of embryo transfer. And that's not a really typical way we would approach uh, treatment for someone to address the whole person to kind of address all of the things that they're dealing with and supporting their fertility at the same time we would work with them for a bit longer and it's kind of like thinking about well if someone has hypertension which is a um a a, a condition that's chronic you have to manage it it's not something you can just treat with one pill and be done with it and your your hypertension is or high blood pressure is addressed for the rest of your life so is it also true with acupuncture you can't just plant expect one session 30 minutes with needles in your body in very specific places to be enough to sort of like radically transform everything for everyone absolutely it's not that magic pill we'd like it to be and sometimes there are is some magic but you know it's truly about being consistent with the therapies and treatments that you are 
you know, uh, pursuing. So let's speak to the hormone piece because we're talking about vulvodynia and painful sex. And as we age, I mean, tissues can just naturally become thinner or more tight. Um, How do you speak to that? And does that come into play with the treatment strategy when it comes to like the different phases of your life? Like I can see that how, you know, velvodynia may be even more prevalent. Maybe you can speak to this too. Like, is it more prevalent the older we get? I can't speak to age being specifically a predictor of uh, whether or not someone will get vulvodynia. In fact, if we know that the pain is because of a hormone change, specifically like your estrogen levels are going down and that changes the texture of the skin, the thickness of the skin, making it more easy to tear, making it more easy to um, get agitated with any kind of friction or pressure, that's a reason for why you're having the pain. And therefore vulvodynia is no longer really the diagnosis. Um, The diagnosis for vulvodynia really does have to Uh, be for no other clear reason. You can have vulvodynia alongside other different um, treatments. So you could be aging, also have an estrogen deficiency, but still there's some other thing that's telling us that no, this is actually not just because of estrogen changes or hormone changes with aging, that actually this is vulvodynia. But I do wanna be careful because I'm not a diagnosing clinician in the United States or in Canada, uh, and I don't diagnose vulvodynia. I rely on uh, the referral from my, um, the specialist that I work with here in, in uh, Portland, Oregon, who tells me like I've, di- I've done the assessment, they'll do a cotton swab test, they'll do some other um, uh, assessments and they'll be like, yes, definitely this is vulvodynia. Why don't you uh, work with this patient? So I guess, I guess in, in summary to this really your question is that um, vulvodynia is it for diagnosis specifically in hormone changes. Let's come back to hormone changes. When we think about uh, aging, Uh, We do need to, as acupuncturists, um, use our therapy to help uh, bring blood flow to the genital tissues so that then it can be estrogenized or absorb topicals that are um, being applied like topical estrogen or other um, pain creams so they can do their job better. That's great. Do you also combine it with a Chinese herbal medicine or other supplementation? I do, as you can see behind me, there's yeah. some of my herbal um, li- library. I don't know my dispensary. Um, yeah, I do. I do combine it. It depends on the person, obviously. Like, there's going to be certain people who don't want to take Chinese herbs, and that's absolutely fine. But then there's other folks who are really into it, and there's no reason why they can't try it. They've tried everything else, and they want to look at another way to see if they can help address their pain. Uh, and I have found in clinical practice, I don't have research for this, but in clinical practice, I have found physical therapy, Chinese herbs, and the topical pain creams have been really helpful for these patients. Awesome. So, and with these patients, are you seeing them ongoing or is it, you know, just a certain set of um, sessions and then they're up and on their way? I really set a very clear expectation that we should see at least 50% reduction in their pain within uh, 12 weeks. And if we don't, then we should keep going and see if we can reduce it again, if we can get that reduction at at 24 weeks. But what I really don't want to do is is, um, if someone's not doing well, uh, that we look at other therapies to bring in because it may, they may need something else. Right. Like you mentioned earlier, like pelvic floor or something Mm -hmm. like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I personally think that we should do multiple things at at the same time. And as researchers, it's difficult because you want to just look at one parameter at a time just to see really what works. But in real life experience, people just want it to go away. Right. Right. (laughs) Like, I just want to have good sex for Pete's sakes. Yes. (laughs) Enjoyable sex. Enjoyable sex. Yeah. So then maybe even with that, like, you know, touching upon or or seeking out help for the mental, emotional help. Right. Right. That's when when we're talking about sexual confidence where, you know, you can if 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 it's always painful to be intimate, 
it's easy to expect pain with intimacy and it's and it's kind of hard to turn that off if you've had it for a really long time so working with a mental health provider who really specializes in this area is super helpful to deal with pain counseling to deal with um we call this catastrophization but really what it is is i i don't really like that term so much but it's it's really about where the expectation that pain will happen makes us expect it and it, and we kind of tense up as a result of it and we want to help us ourselves be relaxed and mm -hmm. receptive and, and enjoy the experience so do you have a couple of tips around that how can we or you know if someone is going through this and there's this anticipatory pain and then you want to actually avoid sex but then what if you're also trying to conceive? So it's like you want to avoid sex, but you can't avoid sex because you want to conceive. So what do you tell someone like that? Like what are like three little tidbits that you can provide to share? That's a great question. I think I bring in more folks because I think it's important that we have very well-trained um, providers, counselors, coaches who really understand the terminology, comfort levels, safety around intimacy. So I, I'm not going to be pushing someone to have um, sexual uh, penetrative uh, intercourse in the sense uh, for procreation if it's so painful that it's it's causing more harm than good. And there's this push and pull, mm. as you were just saying, for those of us who are trying to conceive and also have pain with intercourse, pain with any kind of penetrative sex or any touch whatsoever, where pain, where touch would typically be considered pleasurable, instead becomes just untenable. You can't tolerate it at all. Um, the the folks that I like to bring, so Dr. Lori Brado, who's from the University of British Columbia, uh, who is an just a well known um, psychologist and researcher in sexual uh in all things sexual basically uh i i tend to refer people to her website because i believe that she has resources on there for folk I'm, I'm speaking specifically to the canadians um i believe that that she has resources on how to connect to providers who know what to do in the united like in here in portland i have a collective that i've just joined it's the rose city sexual health collective so i have a sex coach i have a, a marriage and family therapist i have a pelvic floor um, physical therapist that i will be working with um, to help support them so really i i like to bring more folks in but the really simple things that we add in is that give yourself room and time rushing is probably not your friend uh, the second thing is lubricant. We must use lubricant. Please don't expect comfortable sex without lubricant if you know that you already have some discomfort with sex. What's your favorite lubricant on that note? Oh, that's a great question. It's called, um, I was just looking up a, a bunch of them. It starts with a G. Oh my gosh. Um, it's, I'll get that for you. I can't remember the name of it right now, but I can see the bottle. Uh, was it ready for that? <laughs> Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I know. I mean, okay, just so you guys know, this is like a total last minute thing. I'm like, what to talk about people's sex because like people actually have this problem and nobody talks about it. So we need right. to put it front we and personal. And and you know, because we were initially going to speak to this research that you have done with regards to acupuncture and IVF outcome and, and whole systems Chinese medicine is what we talked about. And then also, you know, acupuncture for um decreasing anxiety while one goes through um, IVF and 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 more right but anyway this is like not even just a sidebar this is like so important I'm like we just need to lead with this one a hundred percent it's important because it's the lead into making babies and then you know if we can't uh I mean we can do IVF but if we can do all the steps before that would be ideal and to enjoy it because there gets this it gets to this point where if you've been trying for a while that probably can, you know, make a big impact on relationship and the receptivity that, uh, uh, you know, you were talking about. So I think we're going to be interviewing Alison Armstrong. I don't know if you've heard of Alison Armstrong, mm -hmm. um, on the psychological kind of, you know, acts of like intimacy and, and improving that receptivity. So I'm excited to have her on next mm -hmm. week. Um, and uh, I think silicone is my favorite lubricant base. Was yours a silicone base that you were thinking of? Uh, it, yeah, we don't want to use sticky water-based or um, 
any kind of thing with parabens, obviously, because that can irritate right. tissues. But the main main ingredient that I tell everyone to look for in any product is propylene glycol, because propylene right. glycol can really irritate genital skin. Right. So just like a plain silicone without any of like the glycerin or things like the sugary stuff that can feed right. yeast. And I love that. I love the whole integrative concept because you can rule out infections and estrogen deficiency, like you were talking about with a physician. And then, you know, all the options the village is really important, like having a village of care. So um, we should talk next about, I would love to get into the whole concept of using these uh machines that uh, Mary was telling me about it, um, you know, so for people perhaps who are afraid of acupuncture, or perhaps they can't, or that maybe they don't want to come in, they don't have the time, or they're not making the time, they think they don't have time. So they uh, tell us about these uh, tease machines and how effective they are for supporting fertility before IVF, and then even um, adding it adjunctively for IVF. Oh, that's great. The, so the wonderful thing about T's is really it's a TENS machine and TENS you've probably seen is, and I didn't bring one in here, which was so dumb. Um, <laughs> sorry, everyone. Uh, but it's a machine that has these little electrical pads that you can attach to the skin um, and they emit a very um, gentle uh, electrical stimulation. And the intention is that it will help to produce or induce a re uh, release of like endorphins that help to reduce pain or um there they can if you depending on the how you set it up you can also use it to address fertility so i use it in both my pain patients and my fertility patients wonderful and do you then kind of guide them virtually or would you send a patient home uh with the machine or do you use the machine uh, adjunctively with acupuncture how does it work in that way I do use it adjunctively with acupuncture, but here's the thing. Um, some people really can't come to treatment once a week because of work, because of shift work, especially if they work in a hospital or their teacher, and it's sometimes very difficult to get from the school to, to treatment on time, or maybe it's the points, appointments aren't available, or they live in a rural area and they have no access to someone. And so this is where I think this particular therapy could really be beneficial because it's easy to apply, it's pretty safe. There's a couple of um, parameters we wanna take into consideration before we just like use it. But uh, the the main thing that I wanna be kind of thinking about for TENS is, you know, it's, it is an acupuncture point stimulation method that uses um, electric, an electrical stimulation instead of hand needling and because it, we're not using needles it can be really a preferred therapy for those that are needle phobic and i totally get that when i started acupuncture school i was like so into acupuncture and then we're all new at needling each other and we all needle each other because we're all you know trying to learn and i had to stop getting acupuncture because it was so painful and i it just really overwhelmed me uh and then you know i went to someone who was very skilled and i was like oh yeah i can do this again um okay wait 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 let's let's um i just need to address that because yeah. when you said oh my gosh it was so painful so let's let's yeah, again we new, slow we it were, down yeah we were new as i just said so we were all students we were learning how to needle each other. We had not developed our technique. And uh, so it was painful for me at that time. And the, here's the thing, acupuncture should not hurt. It should be the needle insertion you should never feel. A really highly skilled acupuncturist should be able to insert a needle with very little pain or discomfort. The sensation that you have should be um, a little bit heavy, a little bit achy, but never sharp, stabbing, fiery. And if it is, please find another acupuncturist because um, the one that will not do that uh, because you don't, it, this does not have to be painful. Uh, and if it is painful for you, then consider doing teas instead. Consider doing something else or acupressure. Yes, wonderful, Mary, thank you. So that is a TENS machine that, um, can be uh, used for teas, but here's also an important piece that you can't just choose any machine. It do, you do have to adjust the settings in a very specific way. I don't think we should go into great detail about that because um, 
you know, we don't want people just to kind of slap this on and just do it. Uh, we do, I do think you need a little bit of teaching, a little bit of guidance. Uh, so please don't go run out and buy a TENS machine and just apply it to your body and say, okay, I'm helping my fertility. <laughs> yeah. Um, so D DM us, right. And, yes. and we can actually yes. guide you so that you can get the right product as well as like knowing how to utilize it, because we know that it has to be a certain kind of frequency, certain duration. So there is an art to it and what points to you that is relevant and there's some people who really should not do it so people with pacemakers yes people yes. who have epilepsy people with cancer um, and people with blood clots so we have to be very careful about not applying it in those and and if you're pre or newly pregnant we don't want to be doing it on your abdomen either so okay so i think that kind of answered your question tanya yeah and what's the difference so between t's and tens sorry so I've chimed right. in there. What's again. the difference? What's the difference between T and TENS machines? They are very similar in that clearly they're using the same machine. They're using the same uh, equipment. The difference is the, the type of pulse wave that you're using. So in the ones that are for acupuncture stimulation, it's a wider pulse wave. Whereas the ones that are for pain and nerve stimulation, it's a shorter pulse wave. And you might use different um, hertz or intent, I'm uh, sorry, uh, uh, pulse rates. So the, um, the sorry. The pulse rate is the Hertz. And so that is the one that is about uh, how frequently the stimulation is happening. But there's also this wave that's about the length of the wave. I'm getting very complicated here. I apologize for that. No, that's okay. So if um, uh, we'll break it down even more. So basically there's two machines and they're very similar. Do they work uh, just as well as each other? Like, are they just as effective or is one preferred over the other? They're the same machine as long as it is adjustable. So if you buy a machine with preset, like there's very on the market, there's a lot of tens machines that have 10 preset, you know, uh, uh, settings on there that you can use. And they'll have like little designs on the machine. One will look like a yin yang symbol. <laughs> Another one will be, you know, it'll look like someone's doing massage on you. I have no idea what the measurements are for their pulse rate, their pulse wave and their intensity. So um, this is a lower stimulation, lower intensity approach, whereas with pain, you're going to be more aggressive, more intense, more, you can see more muscle movement with treatment. You won't see that so much with the T's. Yeah, it's well, it's not meant for pain relief. So right. it could be basically doubling. It's the same machine, but you can use it for pain. But then if there is a setting that can be used for T's, then that's more for stimulating in this case, like the ovaries or the uterus or, so let's speak to this because we are talking about, there's some studies that you have passed over to me with regards to T's for recurrent implantation failure, even sperm parameters. Cause you know, we always spot, talk about female reproductive organs and we always forget about the men. So we need to add in that piece and then just embryo transfers itself. And we may even want to talk about anxiety. Right. And, and actually one more ovarian reserve, which like everybody is very, very keen to speak to. Yes. Yes. That's like the big one. Yeah. Um, uh, I do want to be very clear, though. The TENS machine can be used for T's. It's just you have to have the right settings. And why why you want to just not put them on is that you need to have guidance in order to know where to put the, the electrodes and how to set up the machine, how frequently to do it and for how long. Um, so let's first talk about. IVF, like how could T's help someone with IVF? And uh, there's this great meta-analysis that just came out um, in the last year where people who added the T's to their IVF had 42% more clinical pregnancies. And that, so that's like your first pregnancy test. They had 9% more quality embryos, which is great. That's never been found in any other research that we've seen. 45% um, fewer biochemical pregnancies. So those are pregnancies that aren't viable. Uh, they do have a positive pregnancy test, but they're not considered to be um, at a level that could be considered con a viable pregnancy. But here's the big one. This is the most important and the most certain outcome that they found. 42% um, uh, more live births when T's was added to their IVF. And I think that's really important. So 
do you have any questions about it before I move on? So when you're speaking to these researches articles, so it's using teas with no other thing. So no acupuncture in of itself. So it's strictly right. teas, right? right? So that's really significant. That's amazing. That's a game changer for a lot of people who are scared of acupuncture and just not wanting to do it. Yeah, there's 8,000 people in this study. So this was a meta-analysis looking at lots of different studies that they were similar enough to where they met the criteria of the research. And so then they do an analysis of all the studies and they were randomized controlled trials. So in your um, clinic itself, in real time, are you then combining the two or do you just say so for some people one thing? I, I use it in folks with diminished ovarian reserve, number one. I definitely use it in folks before we do the IVF for polycystic ovarian syndrome because I'm, I'm extrapolating from other research where uh, electroacupuncture actually reduced androgens in folks with PCOS. It helped to regulate their insulin sensitivity. It improved their sensitivity to insulin. It improved their sugar metabolism in their bodies ultimately. And it also um, uh, affected their AMH, though so the uh, antral, sorry, not antral follicle count, but the antimalarian hormone, it reduced it. So for polycystic ovarian syndrome folks, it can be elevated in many of them, nearly all of them. Uh, and they saw after at least 12 weeks of therapy that it was reduced by a significant amount. And I can't remember the amount right off the top of my head. Sorry, my dog is barking in the back, so I'm going to be muting myself off and on. <laughs> I can't hear their dog. <laughs> um, so, and then when people are using this on their own at home, are they doing it every single day? No. So this is where the art comes in. So using our experience as acupuncturists, using our um, understanding of Chinese medicine, pattern differentiation of diagnosis ultimately, and then also understanding the biomedical side, the Western side of what, what kind of treatment they're doing, um, where are they in the treatment? This is how we decide how, frequent, how frequently someone should come uh, in for real acupuncture and then how frequently they should do it at home. So it can be anywhere from once a week to you know, every other day to every day. It just depends on the person. I know that's I'm not a very barking. specific answer. <laughs> no, no, it's good. Of course, no. because it's individually specific, yes. right? I mean, yes. we need to, that, that's the thing about doing this. Like you need the guidance of a health professional that knows what the heck they're doing versus just buying a machine, throwing it on and just doing it like with blinders on, right? So right. you can't do that. There is also the risk for certain patients that if you were to do this during an IVF, um, for some folks, it could cause hyperstimulation. So like your polycystic ovarian syndrome person, I might not be using this during the actual stim. Uh, I might be doing it, I may be seeing them for real acupuncture and doing things in a very different way. Okay, so Let's speak to now about the sperm count. Mm, mm -hmm. so, <laughs> uh, so we, I, I, I also didn't talk to you about diminished ovarian reserve. So there was one randomized control trial. Uh, we'll talk about sperm in just a moment. Um, there was one randomized control trial with 240 people and they only had an antral follicle count. So that's the number of follicles that we see on ultrasound. Um, and it was less than five and their FSH was definitely greater than 10. So FSH is follicle stimulating hormone. It's a pretty universally used measure um, uh, for kind of determining what is your ovarian reserve. So it's a pretty clear definition of uh, what could be a diminished ovarian reserve person for this particular study. And what they found was that um, their live birth rate was, uh, was greater in the folks who added teas compared to those that did not. And the, the, the I think the thing is that they used a false uh, tease or, or, you know, treatment. So they had a really good control arm uh, in this particular um, study. There was another retrospective study, which is kind of like the studies that I have done with, with, with respect to IVF. And in that particular study, they also saw that folks with diminished ovarian reserve had a better outcome with respect to uh, adding in the T's during the IVF cycle. So for sperm, 
this is really great because they did this massive study with like i don't know 900 people in it or something like that uh and they did they you know they did teas every single day for um 28 days took two days off and then 28 days again two days off 28 days one more time so that's basically three months and it takes roughly 75 to 90 days for sperm to change anyway and they found increases in the people that did a very specific type of teas, the kind that we recommend, uh, to it saw an improvement in sperm count and sperm motility. They didn't measure morphology in that study, so I, I can't speak to that specifically, but counts were significantly improved and so was motility. And let's just speak to the fact that in the past 50 years, sperm count has Yes. gone down dramatically 50 to 60 percent so what 60%. is deemed normal we have lowered the bar ladies and gentlemen and that's not necessarily a good thing so doing something like this even if the sperm count is showing normal it might not be a bad thing because like you spend a gazillion dollars doing ivf so i believe that you know both partners needs to rise up to the occasion and do you know, the best thing possible to optimize. And I, I I, don't know about you where you are in Portland, but oftentimes at the fertility clinic, I feel like the men get a hall pass. It's like, it doesn't matter. You can uh, just, just do IVF and that's the solution. I think it's starting to shift a little bit where we're really putting more attention on the health of both parents, both of the um, folks providing sperm and or eggs, and I shouldn't say and or, <laughs> you only you typically only do one. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm really happy to see that where they are really kind of focusing a little bit on um, are, is, are both partners eating well? Are both partners avoiding alcohol and um, cannabis and uh, trying to uh, get plenty of fluids and get exercise like those are very basic recommendations that everyone pretty much is receiving now which wasn't even part of the consult before um, right. which I really think is a, a, a move in the right direction but what isn't happening is that I don't I agree with you Mary that um, because there's ICSI because you know it's just one uh, donation and done uh, I don't think there's a lot of uh, focus put on um, preparing someone for that. Whereas as we as in the integrative medicine world really do want to put some attention on, you know, it's, it takes two sex gametes. It takes one sperm, one egg to create an embryo and the health of the parents for both of them is really influential on the quality of the embryo. I mean, there is data that's telling us that um, paternal age is really influential in outcomes, that the health of the of the paternal health is also really influential in the outcomes. So I, I also agree, we need to put more attention here, really bring in both partners if we can. But, you know, as, as we know, in clinic, the person who comes is typically the person with the eggs. And um, so we just got to try to do what we can do. So I'm just going to ask you this off the cuff. Yeah. A person has normal sperm parameters. Mm -hmm. They're going to do IVF. What do you say to that person? Oh, you know, you're doing a good job and leave it at that. Or what? Which And, and there's, oh, by the way, they may have normal sperm parameters. And yet they are smoking marijuana and they are drinking alcohol. Like, what do you say to them? First, I, I really do follow what ASRM says, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, is that they discourage all uh, cannabis use as um, uh, an adjuvant to daily living um, or an activity of daily living when someone's trying to conceive. When it comes to alcohol, there is some there's some data that says that, you know, heavy drinking is really more negative to um, uh, outcomes than uh, light drinking. I, I don't, I actually do ascribe to a more um, uh, I, I, I'm not an absolutist, so I'm not saying no alcohol ever. What I am though saying is like, this is what the data says. And in my outcome, you know, like in my handouts for folks, I'm like, if you're going to have a drink, have about two a week, try to try not to have more than that. Um, 15 drinks or more a week has been associated with uh, poorer outcomes. So I just really want to think about um, if you're going to do, if you are going to have some alcohol, limit the amount that you have, make it something you really enjoy and um, savor it. So I'm going to speak to a very specific case. Yes, go for it. 
the partner of this woman, you know, she's in a place of, gosh, like, I just want to preserve my fertility right now. I'm young, I'm vibrant, and just in case a safety um, measure, right? So it's like her plan was to um, freeze eggs. I'm like, well, if you're going to freeze eggs and you have a partner, why wouldn't you freeze embryos? And the problem is that the husband is actually doing all those things. Right. So what do we do? Like, can we get him on board to say, gosh, you're spending a gazillion dollars on this when we want to have embryos frozen versus eggs frozen? What would you say to that person? That's a great question. Um, I always have to remind myself I don't get to choose people's journeys for them. Uh, But what we know from the data right now is that freezing eggs is far better than when we first started. When Mary and I first started working, uh, I think you've been doing this a little bit longer than me. I've been doing it since like 2001. Um, You could not freeze eggs then. And the techniques have gotten so much better where the um, follicles that are stimulated and the eggs that are retrieved and frozen immediately and not made into embryos are, um, are are, are better than when uh, they were done many years ago. So the, the, the technology has gotten better. The, ideally though, embryos are um, preferred uh, for cryopreservation. And I guess, I guess we can't, <laughs> I, this sounds like a really challenging um, case. I, I guess I would, I would counsel personally, freeze the eggs, uh, do the embryos later, um, you, I think that it's, there's so many ethical challenges around, you know, right. Yeah. Longevity and uh, with, well, let me just say this in a different way. Um, I, I would definitely, I agree with you that I would probably just focus on eggs rather than creating embryos that are from gametes that are not probably, uh, as healthy as they could be. Thank you. What's your preference? How I'm curious on what you're thinking, what you are thinking. Well, I mean, we can't change people. And it's just, you know, as we always say, you can lead a horse to water and it's up to them to drink. So it's like if a conversation is possible to change this other person's mind, then absolutely do the embryo thing. But if not, then you're right. You know, the egg freezing would be the better alternative, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think the data is the best thing that I like to rely on when it comes to changing lifestyle um, patterns in partners. It's the Mm -hmm. only thing that I found to actually be helpful. I don't think shame works. I wouldn't, I I mean, that's not helpful in medicine anyway. Um, And certainly not helpful in relationships either. No, not at all. Um, I think encouragement, patience, those are very important um, uh, aspects and just recognizing we're human you know, and which is also why I am more likely to just try and help people find ways to make it work in their life and also remind them this is not forever. This is for if 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 alcohol is something that's a part of your life, it's a part of your social life, it's a very significant um, part of your connection to your community. Um, maybe it's a, a part of your dinners that is a very important part of your ritual. Um, keeping in mind that we're, we're not talking about, um, alcoholism. Okay. So I just want to be clear about that, but, uh, we want to just remind folks that this is, this is temporary that we need like 75 days, 90 days to really start to see a change in sperm quality and sperm count. Um, alcohol does contribute to oxidative stress. It can have negative impacts on the um, quality of the sperm, even though the numbers look good. But there's also data that says it reduces count and it, it affects motility and morphology. So, you know, the data is there to, t- to help discourage folks. But again, we just have to kind of meet people where they are. And I, I really think that's an important for me. I feel like that's an important place for me to always hold is that I see you. I see you for who you are and it's OK. And we're going to work on this together. Thank you for providing that insight, because isn't it true? It's like, you know, as an acupuncturist, we could just do a protocol method and call it a day. But really, it is super important and more important to actually address the human, the human behind. And and the and it's more than just the physical treatment, isn't it? Yeah. 
So let's just switch gears. And now we're going to speak to recurrent implantation failure. So what that means, actually, t- tell us what that means. And then what can we do about it from the TCM perspective? So recurrent implantation failure is where um, you'll go through IVF and and even though viable um perhaps a genetically normal euploid embryo is is transferred uh, back into the womb or to the uterus um, there's still no implantation there's still no pregnancy there's still you know there's no baby to have and uh, so we have found in some of the research with respect to teas there's some there's one or two papers on acupuncture they aren't really high quality so i don't really want to go into them very much but i will say that with more research, I think we are going to see that um, acupuncture also has a benefit here. But for T specifically, it's a promising technique to improve those reproductive outcomes where RIF or uh, recurrent implantation failure is a problem. Um, So just to back up, because everybody joins in at a different time. So TEAS is the transcutaneous electroacupoint stimulation. So using a little tiny device that is put on acupuncture points set out by your acupuncturist, because we don't randomly do this. Right. And we have seen its benefits for multiple things, and we're speaking to implantation failure specifically today. Yeah. So um, what they found was that teas improved the live birth rate and the clinical pregnancy rate uh, over uh, folks who um, did not do any teas at all in one uh, retrospective study. And then in another study that was a randomized control trial, there was also um, more live births than the people who had uh, teas added to their IVF um, than the folks who did not. But the the control group in that particular study was actually a placebo control. It was a mock version of T's or tens on acupuncture points. And so people may be excited hearing this because isn't it true? Like you've had a failed IVF transfer and you're like, oh my gosh, the automatic is like, I must have an implantation issue. I must have an immune issue, something like that. And so it's like, well, how do I use this? Do I use it every day? Do I use it once a week? How do you guide people towards this? Uh, This is great. Uh, So the research that we're seeing now is mostly where people do it every other day from cycle day five till the day of embryo transfer. If you're just doing it during a cycle, but beforehand, um, I will be varying, making a variable recommendation based on the person's individual needs. But I do want to say one other thing I just um, uh, saw published in the last um, maybe two months where there was a uh, sort of a nested study within an IVF study where people added transcutaneous electroacupuncture stimulation to their IVF. In the nested study, they looked at um, the development of the uterine lining as part of the research. And what they found is that the people who added the T's had more of those little um, they developed their, their uterine lining in a way that was more receptive to pregnancy. So there's these things called pinnipodes that show up in the lining of the uterus to help sort of like land the plane, if you will. It helps the embryo implant into the lining. It signals mm. the embryo like, hey, this is a very plush, welcoming space in the uterus. We would love for you to implant here, you know, over here, over here, land here. And uh, they saw more of those in the lining in the folks who added teas versus the folks that didn't. So, so cool. That- Yes, it's super cool. So that's a signal to me that we're helping to fully not only just increase the the thickening or the lining and with respect to how thick it is, but also the morphology of the lining that it is trilaminar that it is receptive that you have more of these little um, extensions onto the villi of the uh, uterine lining that help to promote implantation. But you know, we there's all these things about lining that we we don't know and the timing of of embryo transfer is really key and if you're doing um lots of different kinds of uh uh methods with your let's say you're having a frozen embryo transfer and it's a natural cycle or a program cycle which is where you're they're giving you estrogen they're timing everything um there's there's a lot of variability here that we don't know about yet so i think it's so important to state 
that, you know, what you're doing at the fertility clinic, there's a qu- sometimes the question is like, oh, but I'm doing intralipid, I'm doing uh, embryo glue, like, is this going to be contraindicated? Like, can I actually use both at the same time? So how do you speak to that? Well, um, so <laughs> intralipids and, and embryo glue are um, still emerging technologies within IVF and um, if you look at the practice guidelines of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, which is something that I look at regularly, uh, they do not recommend those two therapies as as alongside IVF. Um, so, so in my city, we don't have anybody doing those things. Oh, is that right? Wow. Okay. Yeah. So they do do this in Toronto. And um, so I guess the question becomes, it's like, there's so many different kinds of add-ons. And as a person going through IVF and like you start some people will choose the everything but the kitchen sink approach because it's like I'm desperate and I just want it to work so I'm going to throw everything at it and see what will stick Mm -hmm. so coming from that perspective it's like how do we tease out (laughs) tease so to speak meaning you know is it can we add that on like because there are people that are literally doing that in Toronto right all of it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is it too much to add on? Is it, but you're saying that in fact, there may be more research that is pointing towards positive um, outcome with the T's over something like the intralipid, over something like the embryo glue that has, I I know we actually interviewed Dr. Genevieve Genet. So if you haven't seen that, you have to go back to that by the time this comes out and and she's actually a immunologist for fertility so all the reis the fertility doctors actually go go to her Mm -hmm. and she said exactly what you said it's like don't bother with the but you know some people will still choose it anyway in in the just in case so i i'm not gonna say negatively about me neither i think that there are cases where intralipids actually were something that needed to be done for that particular patient um and I don't understand reproductive immunology to a level that a reproductive immunologist does. So I want to be very clear about that. But what? But to your specific question of can you add teas to embryo glue? Can you add teas to uh, um, intralipids? Uh, yes, you can add it to intralipids. I don't know enough about embryo glue to make a statement about it. Very good. I think we beat a lot of things to death here. Um, Tanya, do you have any more questions? Because or Lee, do you have any other insights that you want to share? Because you know we are really stating a lot of information. I hope it's not overwhelming. I was trying to comment that I do love that the study she's reporting do focus on uh, birth outcome rather than only clinical pregnancy rates, and I think that's an important factor. Oh, absolutely. It's not just important. It's the most important thing, isn't it? Who well, cares about this getting is pregnant? New. This is new. Exactly. Baby, right? This is newer. I feel like the studies used to be on acupuncture that it was more like, oh, there was a higher pregnancy rate, but this is, it's newer. Do you see that in the data that it's, yes. they're now focusing more on live birth? So yes, I love that. We, the <laughs> early studies, the ones in the 2000s, the early 2000s um, were highly focused on clinical pregnancy rate. Um, and it wasn't until like, like late 2000s, definitely in the, the teens, where um, we started to really look at live birth rates. Um, I do want to just add one more thing here, and that is really about, I want to also talk about acupuncture for a second. Um, you know, the literature around acupuncture for IVF is kind of mixed, and it's confusing. Um, uh, so um, I want to just say that when people add acupuncture to their IVF, it is likely to improve their their chances of having a pregnancy and a live birth. Uh, the The data is confusing because we've only seen research look at mostly acupuncture on the day of embryo transfer. But as we've been saying here, that's not the only intervention that we would do in the real world. Um, and it's not it's, enough. It's not it, enough. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, when we look at some of the observational data, the larger data sets, not just small ones, um, you know, data sets with a thousand people in them, we do see that when people add more sessions of acupuncture, when they add in 
a whole systems of traditional Chinese medicine, which is lifestyle modifications, dietary modifications. Um, it could include other modalities with, alongside acupuncture. It could potentially er, um, also include Chinese herbs if it's appropriate. But uh, those were associated with um, a twofold increase in the odds of live birth with IVF. And what was even more important to me was not only having a live birth, but a 75% reduction in the odds of having um, a, a biochemical pregnancy. So if you got pregnant, you pretty much stayed pregnant. Uh, and the miscarriage rates weren't different. So um, I think we need to be looking at a larger dose of acupuncture in our research, it, getting funding for these studies. It's extremely difficult. I don't know if we're going to see that in the near future, um, at least not in the United States or Canada, because I don't know who's going to put money into this right now. But, but So I I'm going to cut in for one second, because yeah. for those of you that, that are watching or listening, um, if you don't know who Dr. Lee Hollander Rubin is, she is like freaking phenomenal, a pioneer. And you didn't, you're so humble. You done, re, like you are the leading researcher in this, uh, in my opinion, and you've put us on the map. So I really want to thank you. And, you know, I, I refer to your study all the time. I think, was it 2015 or 2016, the IVF and whole systems? I TCM. think I published it in 2016. It was 2016. I, I remember it so long ago. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. So it was like, how exciting because we're looking, putting it on the map and saying, hey, acupuncture along with diet and lifestyle and, you know, herbs, they can increase the um, live birth rate, right? Because again, as we said, taking home a baby is the most important thing. Getting pregnant and not taking home a baby, not so important. So this yeah, is we what definitely counts. saw the relationship that when they added it, it was associated with more live births. I can't say it caused it because it wasn't a randomized control trial, unfortunately. Right. See, I love your research brain. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. So I, I know um, if you have five minutes, I want to do a separate question with regards to, because we didn't actually talk about this, about how acupuncture or and teas helps with anxiety, um, especially around IVF. Do you have a moment to discover? I do. Okay, I do. cool. Yeah. Let's do that real quickly. And this will be like a separate little tidbit um, podcast, which is so super important because IVF, as everyone knows, it is so stressful. And even though some people will be remain calm as they go through it, their insides, their adrenals are overtaxed because the process itself, and we know through research that going through IVF, especially at a fertility clinic, increases our stress levels equally to someone going through um, life challenges like cancer or, or heart disease. So right. speak to us about how acupuncture, how um, teas can, or, or, you know, re in relationship to anxiety. That's a great question. So um, as clinicians, you and I both know that, and even if you go through this, you see, and you have friends that go through this, you know it's hard. And there is research that says three quarters of women, two thirds of men going through IVF are clinically anxious. So this is a highly prevalent issue. Now, one thing we know about acupuncture, one thing we know about transcutaneous electroacupuncture stimulation is that it helps you to relax. But we didn't have any real clear data that said, yes, 100% it does this. So. I did another study and it was published early this year, I think. <laughs> I can't remember anymore. <laughs> well, um, thank you for the study. Again, <laughs> you know, you're awesome. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, but I I I really felt like we needed to we needed to know is there a there there? You know, is it true that I think it helps anxiety? Is it really true? So we I endeavored to do the study. So we did find out that acupuncture did provide significant benefit to patients suffering with IVF related anxiety. And that was compared to a control. And we can reasonably extrapolate that acupuncture may also benefit those just trying to conceive, you know, with timed intercourse or at home or with IUIs, that it likely will help benefit them with anxiety as well. And why is that important? Why is that important? Why is it? Because it will help you continue forward if for some reason the cycle was not successful. One of the biggest reasons for dropout is stress, anxiety, and depression alongside these therapies. And if you find that it's so 
much of a burden emotionally. It is really easy to want to just stop before you actually get to achieve your goal of having a child. And I, and I know Mary, I imagine you would feel the same way because we've known each other for years, actually. We've been running in the same circle for years. Yes. Is that we really want you to be able to achieve your goal and stay healthy. Like we want you to be healthy. We want your baby to be healthy and we want you to be healthy after you deliver your child. And um, I see in my own clinical practice, as we use um, acupuncture and East Asian medicine to help folks navigate their fertility journey, that it's so common to see this burden of emotional stress and anxiety alongside trying to conceive. But I really do also see that every time we use these interventions, people feel better. So if I may add. Feeling oh, better. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Feeling better helps you keep going. Yes. And so this is where I'm going to add in. It's like when we say help you keep going, it's not just the IVF or, you know, this right. fertility journey. It's about keep you going in your life. Mm hmm. Right. I told you when we were uh, just before we came on air, someone reached out and says, oh, Mary, I'm taking a break from all things fertility. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. So that was a missing in my communication, because really it's, you know, and because typically I when people come in, I'm like, you don't come in just for IVF treatment or right. or just for fertility. We come in as helping you to be the whole human that you are. So no, no matter what you're embracing, we've got you covered because you deserve it, right? Yes, I would say within the whole system of East Asian medicine, we cannot ignore the physical health from the emotional health. We take both into consideration and treatment is designed to support you in all of those facets. So getting pregnant, staying pregnant, having a healthy baby isn't just about quote your fertility. It's also about your sleep. It's about your digestion. It's about your um, ability to uh, get through the day without feeling like you want to, you know, choke someone. It's, uh, I mean, I'm being a little bit dramatic there, but, but it, you know, I hear a lot of really intense um, personal stories every day about like, this is so hard. I don't know if I can keep going. It's okay to take a break. I think it's always important that we tell people it's okay to take a break. Let us help you let us help support you through this break so that when you're ready to re-engage, you can and you're confident and you're healthy. Absolutely. Because you know, don't we know that going at it alone is not so helpful? Like we, uh, you know, I always say that it doesn't, it's more than just having a village take care of your child. It's, we need to take, we need to have a village to take care of you in the present moment, because that's important. That's how you thrive. And that's how you create life in the end as well. And have you be more receptive? Yeah, I feel like we love to be so independent and there is something really lovely about being able to stand on one's own two feet, but sometimes we do need to be held, you know, we need to be supported so that we can stand on our own two feet for a very long time and to be able to support ourselves through the rest of the process of, you know, building our families. Um, I really did want to just say one more thing about like, how does this actually help people? Like, what are the mechanisms? Like we're saying that we help you, we, we're saying that we relax you. What do we know about how acupuncture and tradition, or sorry, teas can actually help folks? And we know from data on humans and animal studies that acupuncture does help you know sort of calm the nervous system and by calming the nervous system through the i'll get technical here through the central sympathetic nervous system we use the acupuncture it goes through specific fibers in the nervous system that causes vasodilation and by increasing vasodilation you're not only softening the body but you're also improving blood flow to those important organs that are part of reproduction but we don't always have to direct blood flow to that if you're not trying to reproduce um, the other thing that we know for sure is that it induces the release of neurotransmitters. And what do we know neurotransmitters do? They help our mood, <laughs> but they also help our hormone balance. And by helping our hormone balance, it can infect your regular ovulation or your production of sperm. It can help you have 
better fertility as a result of it. And then the final thing that I just think we should just touch on, which is the one I think most of us know about, is that every time that you use acupuncture or even that you use teas, it's helping your body release its own natural painkillers, endorphins, which also have this wonderful side effect of mitigating all of that stress anxiety that you're undergoing while trying to conceive. So, so that I'm, you won't be, so that you won't be wringing someone's neck, as yes, you mentioned earlier. <laughs> it helps you to relax. It helps you to cope and be able to continue. I love that. Thank you for addressing all of this. It is so crucial. And gosh, you are a breath of fresh air in our um I, I just can't even speak to how much I honor you. And I am so grateful for your time and effort. And I know, that, hey guys, we're recording at a time when it's um, American Thanksgiving. I'm Canadian, so it doesn't matter to me, but it's your holiday time and you're spending this holiday time with us so that she can educate you so that you can have informed choice so you can be empowered on your journey so you're not alone and that you have hope. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Mary, thank you as well. You are such a um, avid and dedicated educator for our community. And I really appreciate your work as well. Thank you.